Hello and welcome to another live stream edition of the John Conn Report. Do me a favor, subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcast. You're watching on YouTube. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media. That's A-M-P-I-R-E. Always much appreciated when you tune in. And don't forget, you can read my work on ESPN.com. And for those watching, you can see Bram Weinstein, the voice of the commanders here joining me. You can listen to him on ESPN 630. So this is a draft wrap-up show. Bram, we haven't we haven't had a chance to talk a lot about the draft. So I'm curious what you thought. Uh, well, I mean, I love Jaden Daniels. I'm glad that that w- that's what the decision was. Um, you know, I, they they had me chasing my tail like they had us all chasing our tail for a few weeks there, even though it appears the decision was pretty clear for them. And you know, I think we've talked a lot here and on my show, you know, through the last few months that. I, I had a hard time buying that they would go in any different direction. Right. He just was too good of a talent. Um, so I'm not surprised that's where they landed. And I'm obviously very excited about him. We can talk about him specifically. But then, you know, the second and third round, um, I'm very excited about Mike Sanistrill. Like, I think that was just a great pick. Um, and then they started to check off a lot of boxes. They needed a young tight end. They got one. They needed a tackle. They got one. They needed a linebacker. They needed... Um, an edge rusher, they, they started to kind of address all of these types of issues and, you know, let's see how this plays out, you know, over the next few years, really more than anything. But, um, I, I, in, in general, um, I'm very pleased and, you know, I think there's some work to do. Like, I don't think they address tackle, um, in a way that I think they would be comfortable with heading into the season. We'll see how they deal with it now post-draft, but outside of that, Um, the haul that they got, I'm hoping is going to work out for them. And it looks like two, three plug-in starters have come in immediately here. Well, listen, and the Johnny Newton was, is a pretty big part of that too. And the one thing too, I'm curious for, first of all, and you know, I was talking about this for about a week or so leading in the draft that the choice was not necessarily between Jaden and Drake may it was chances. The, the, it was, more likely it was between Jaden and JJ. And that is really what, how it played out. And I know they said that Jaden was the top guy on their board. And I think other people there echoed that to me. Now you always hear that after a pick is made. However, I do know like it was not between Jaden and Drake. So we can, that, that part was real. The other part too, Bram, that I'm curious on from your perspective, because every time there's a new group, every time you like, you talk about like, Oh my gosh, this hall, you know, oh, they got all these captains, et cetera. Well, they've gotten those in the past. Mm-hmm. But it does feel like the difference to me in this particular draft, what you hear and what you hear immediately, and sometimes what you hear a year or two later is different, but what you hear immediately is that the fits, right? Like they have a plan for these players. And I think that's something that I don't always feel like existed in the past that there was a good enough plan over in a, in a plan that was in sync with what the, what people drafting might think versus what some of the assistant coaches might think, et cetera. That to me kind of stood out with this as well. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the Newton pick, we could talk about it, I think was um, best player available that they actually, you know, probably didn't truly expect him to be there. Maybe they thought he might be, you know, once the second day started, Um but they needed, we talked about this a lot, and the way we were talking about it for months was, obviously, they're going to take a quarterback. Obviously, they're going to try to get a tackle. I think, obviously, they need a corner, but that's the one that I think might fall through the cracks, if you will, of the boxes that need to be checked, and it didn't work out that way. And I'll say another thing just about, just largely about the drafts in general, and you just don't know, um, you just don't know, you know, how these people are going to, you know, act until you see them do it. Um and we all know they needed a tackle and we all know that they tried to get back into the first round and it just didn't get accomplished. And so there was no willing taker for them. And then once Amarius Mims went 18 to the Bengals, I went, I, I just, I don't think this is going to happen on day one. And then you get to day two and you just, all of a sudden you're assuming that they're going to take a tackle early, but the run on the better prospects had ended and was gone. And so are they going to overdraft a player? And I actually thought it was very telling that they didn't, that they went, you know, at a position group that was a little unexpected, but the player was probably a little higher up on their board than they expected. They didn't think he'd be there. 
Then they traded out a 40 and moved down and you still expected a tackle. And you'll notice that like the next kind of round of tackles didn't really start to go off the board till right before they were going to be drafting again. And so did they want Rosengarten from Washington? Did they want somebody else that they made a choice between? I don't know. And you'll never get a true answer about that. But what they proved to me was they're not going to go out of their way, even though there's a need to overdraft somebody. And I thought that was kind of an important takeaway to me, especially in the second round and even trading down to acquire a third second round pick and still not quote unquote overdrafting a player because he wasn't that high on their board. Oh, I agree. And that's why I like picks like Newton and Sanders still too. Now they needed a corner, but you thought you kept thinking outside, outside, outside. Yeah. They got a guy who can be a playmaker inside. And I also think this is where I talk about fit. Because one of the things Quinn talks about when he talks about guys near the line is their blitzing ability. He, one, of, one of the things with Jamin Davis, they wanted to see, can he be a good blitzer? When you see like a Jordan McGee, the, the, the linebacker from Temple, that's something I think he could do well. Now, in coverage, I wasn't all that wild with him. But I think as a guy going moving, as a linebacker who going forward, I think he can do, right? So like that's how they – I think there's a vision for them. And it's funny, Bram, because like even like looking at last year's class, even at the end of the draft, it was like I don't – I didn't see where you're going to get a lot of contributions from this class. A lot of things didn't really add up and make sense to me yeah. um, beyond like, you know, beyond the first pick in a lot of ways. And I'm a big Quan Martin fan. But so with this class, I think each of these guys makes sense. Now – the one thing I want to get into, because a lot of people are going to ask about this as well, is the left tackle position. Yeah. Um, one thing to note, like they took Coleman. And one thing, like when people see the range of guys on the board, a range on the board, there's not always this huge gap between a guy who might get drafted 35 or 40 versus a guy who drafted in the 60s or something like that. The, the gap is, is much closer than you probably realize. In a lot of cases, I think in this tackle class, that's the case. I don't know if Coleman can be their starting left tackle. That's what I don't know. And I do know that Cornelius Lucas is a good backup who could come in to start. What's your, I wouldn't say, I want to see the kid on the field because you don't know, but what's your thoughts on that position and how they, how they have addressed it? Well, I think that, you know, like, they weren't trading out of number two. They were, so there, the hope was there'd be, you know, the board started to fall the way I think a lot of us expected it to. There'd be a lot of quarterbacks, a lot of wide receivers. At some point, somebody would take a defensive player and that would start a run there. And I think the hope was that one or two of these many really high-end prospects at the position that they needed would fall into the twenties. And at that point, they would then have the possibility of moving up to get one of them. And that's why I mentioned Amarius Mims. He's not that I know whether they wanted him or not, but his name going off at 18 told me everything I needed to know. The players that they might target aren't going to get there. So the tackles went, not only was there a run of them, there just was the really good ones went as high as most of the mock draft pundits thought they would. So this put them in a situation. Um, the only player that fell into the twenties that I felt was a viable name was the tackle from Arizona, whose name I'm forgetting now that went to green Bay and he went around 25 or 26. And I, you know, again, this is without knowing whether they liked him or targeted him, but once that was gone, it was going to be very, very, very difficult for them to accomplish this. And then now we get to day two and you start asking the questions, are they going to overdraft a player? because they have the need and they didn't do it. And I thought that that showed a lot of restraint, a lot of discipline, but I think they know they have to address this. And, you know, like hopefully the third round pick is someone that they can, you know, it, they can, can become a starter, whenever that will be. My expectation is they will sign a tackle, a veteran in this next wave of free agency, and he'll come in and compete for this job. And, you know, this, this also goes back to, there were a lot of holes to fill. You only have so many draft picks and I think they wanted to fill this. It just didn't happen. So they have to reverse course. And I said this last year, I'm like, this team screams taking a left tackle with their first round pick. Well, you know, everything changed. They went in a different direction and they had too high of a pick to think of it that way. Next year screams taking a left tackle with their first round pick. 
I just think this year they're going to have to figure out a way to bridge through with veterans or the hope is the third round picks ahead of the curve. Right. And the Mims was a guy that I think they felt might slip through the cracks a little bit that I think really tempted would have tempted them big time to move up. The other problem with moving up too is um, nobody wanted to move back. Like my, I was told Friday morning, nobody wanted to move back more than three or four spots and certainly not to 36. So I think that was a hard thing. And then it's like, if you want to go up higher, now you're mortgaging more of the future to get one position. And that's why I say like, then you have to measure the gap between how you see guys up here versus you obviously see them over here and the impact they can have on the team. So I think the other hard part, now I'm not, I'm not sold that they're going to bring another left tackle in. Like, I'm not sure who's going to become available that would really challenge for a starting job at this point when you have, you, you know, you do have a guy you can throw in there and Lucas, who is your swing tackle, unless you get fortunate that a guy like Aleno, someone who can be a, a, you know, placeholder for a couple of years or even a yeah. year can come out. That doesn't happen very often. So I think Coleman's got to develop and they, you know, but I don't know. Um, and I'm going to have his coach on here at some point on the podcast, but I don't know what the likelihood of that is. I do know that some people think he can be a left tackle in this league. Some line coaches I really respect and they, they feel like he's a good athlete and felt he was a good value pick, but when does he become that? And, and I think the other thing in this too, with the offensive line, it's funny because I keep getting asked about the offensive line. Well, they addressed it in free agency. They signed a center and a start. They signed a starting center and starting guard. We just don't know. In week six, we are not sure who's going to be that left tackle. But I also am curious on the impact of the scheme and the coaching on the line. Yeah. And that, you know. And well, okay. They, they signed a center. They signed somebody they think is going to compete yeah. to be the starting left guard. Like, like that, I don't think that's a promise to Allegretti. And I, I think the hope is he's going to be a starting left uh, guard. Yeah. Cosby's a good carryover. We haven't talked about Andrew Wiley yet. Um, I'm willing, and I a lot of people in the chat after I say this, I'm willing to hear out a do-over with him at right tackle that, you know, let's see if scheme is a little bit different for him. Let's see if it works a little different for him. He is a pro. I, and no one's calling him a pro bowler here. But you might see a better result. I'm open-minded to you might see a better result with a different scheme with him at right tackle. But at left tackle, I would describe it as I'm not overly comfortable with what's there right now. And I do expect them to do something to address it. They do have a lot of cap room. That said, and you know this, like teams are not apt to trade good tackles. They just, they don't do it. And they're not available very often. But at some point in this spring or maybe into the summer into training camp where there's a surprise veteran release or somebody's available, I think they're going to have to bring in another veteran in here um, to, to, uh, to compete. That's, that's what I think is going to happen. And, and I expected this. Right. Virginia Slim just threw up in my mouth, Bram, on Wiley. <laughs> I am, I know I'm in the minority of this, but I am open-minded to give that one another shot uh, because I do think he's a pro and I'm not so sure that like that what you saw from him last year in that scheme benefited him very much. Well, nobody would benefit it from dropping back 70% of the time. And somebody brought up the old tackle from left from Green Bay. David Bakhtiari has played in the last three years. He's played a combined 14 games. Or 13 games. Sorry, not the answer. You can't you can't bring in a, a guy who hasn't been, um, you know, on the field and durable just because. And so I don't know that there's, you know, like I said, I don't. I think they feel, I don't know. I think they feel comfortable with what they have. Whether or not they should, it's hard to say because I haven't seen the guy in the field. I do remember when Brandon Sheriff was picked, and everybody's like, I remember before that draft, it was like, okay, he's a right, ta he's a tackle, or he could play guard. Well, you watch him in the first week or two of practice, especially against the Texans, you realize he's a guard. So I don't know that with Coleman. I do, I, you know, I think there, it sounds like he's a good athlete. And, and when you watch him, he's a good player, but what position? And so um, the other thing too, is when you bring up like Ben Sanute, the tight end, when you watch him play, like he's going to help that line as well as an extra blocker. So th that's why I say there, there are things I'm still curious about with the line and like, the line wasn't – there were other issues in, instead of just the line. And some of it was coaching. Some of it was a young quarterback who needed more help from coaches, from the line, et cetera, and from himself. But I think that Sanu, when you watch him block Bram, he's going to help the run game too. 
And Sinute? You know, is that how you pronounce his name? I thought it was Sinet. Sinet. Well, Sinet. Sinet. Well, then it's Sinet. Sorry. Ben okay. is Ben. So ben. Sinet. Yeah, you're right. Sinet. So my my bad, Ben. Um, but but when you watch him play, he's he's going to be a good blocker. Like that's what he does. And so I think yeah. like that's something to watch as well. Like how Sinet. those guys can help the line as well. Look, 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 just think about this for a moment. Okay. They've signed, I don't know, was it 20 free agents somewhere in that neighborhood? They just drafted nine players. Um, they brought in a bunch of undrafted free agents. We'll see what happens with them. I mean, they're staring down, you know, 30 plus different faces on this team. And, and I would, and in a salary cap era, guess what? Nobody has a complete roster anymore. So there were going to be holes, you know, and I, I want to, I'm going to find this one comment from, Amy, who said this, um, why is it always that they're two or three years away? That's been said for years. Why can't they win this year like the Texans did? It's always two to three years away every year. I agree that Washington's actually a wild card here based on Jane Daniels. Like if he is ahead of the curve, um, we might expect some different results this year if our division is willing to comply. Remember that part of the Texans thing too. The Colts lost Anthony Richardson reset year. The Titans were in a reset year. And the Jaguars underperformed, which helped them get to the place where they got to. Is Washington in a situation where Philadelphia and Dallas are going to be very average? I think that's that's hard to know. And Washington's a wild card here because I have these visions of Jaden Daniels having a C.J. Stroud-like start to his career too. And I hope that you're right about that. And I hope they get off to a good start. But the larger point is, and the Texans will tell you this too, they had an incomplete roster last year. They just kind of got off on a really good start. I'm hoping this happens too, but we have one just like everybody else and left tackles part of it. So to think that they were going to fill every hole, considering how much they did to reshape the roster, I think is being a little overly optimistic about the job that could be done. And largely, and this is obviously biased, but like largely, I think they've done an unbelievable job baselining the roster and what they've done to this point, but they're not complete. And I and I don't think they would tell you they are, honestly, no. heading into the spring now. No, not at all. And, and to be clear, like, I don't know how far away they are because, again, we don't know the impact of the coaching. I mean, it's like, I think that defensive staff will be really good. And I think this defense, I expect it to be much improved. So, I, you know, they, I think that's the hard part to know is we can all see the roster and the players but what's the impact of the coaching on these guys? What, what's the impact of, the, of, of having a new defensive backs coach and in, in system for, for Benjamin St. Juiced? You know, how does it help Emmanuel Ford's development? I don't know those answers yet, right? So I think that's something that's going to be seen too. And, you know, to be clear, when I'm talking about, you know, Ben Sinnott, I'm not saying he's enough to make up for a left tackle. But what I am saying is he can help the line and the run game and you can mitigate some other issues um, as well in, in that. And we don't know, like, and no, nobody on here knows what Coleman can do. Like just yeah. Googling and watching a couple plays on there is like, I don't know. And I'm not, all I know is that they draft him to play it. I want to see him play it before I make up my mind, whether or not he can. I, I do have questions about everything with that as you should, because we don't know. And he wasn't, he wasn't, um, you know, he wasn't, you know, a top pick, but again, like you, when you're needing a lot of guys, like you have the best way to get better is to draft good players. And if you think Newton and Sam are still are your guys in that round, then get them because that's how you get better. And so yeah. I'm okay with that. The other thing is someone brought up DJ Humphreys. DJ Humphreys is coming off a torn ACL. So yeah. I don't think he's going to be the answer either. So I think that's what I'm saying. It's hard to find guys at that spot. They yeah, have someone to else make said it David Bakhti. Someone else said David Bakhti. That's what I said. And yeah. he's I barely played over the That's last already, year. Serious right. knee injuries. So, I mean, right. that to me is a total risk. You know, right. if, if he'd be willing to come here, you bring him in. My expectations would be low because physically he's been able to no, perform we are, yeah. a long time now. And, like, this is a tough position. Like, it's a hard one to get. Yeah. People typically hang on to them. Um, they're hard to acquire, but I'll stick to my guns here. I do believe they're going to acquire another veteran one way or the other at some point. I just, I, I don't see how they're totally comfortable with the setup as it is right now. I, and I, I don't know, like, and I don't know how do you acquire that veteran? Who's worthy of that to give up a pick to do that? That's the hard part. Now, if you go out and if it's a release, then you're still getting a guy who was released and they're, you know, you don't give up good left tackles very often. Right. 
So I think that's going to be the, that to me, Bram, is the hard part with that. Um, and, you know, I think that's something, listen, if it comes available, that's great. I don't know that it will. And the other thing is with the Texans and someone else also brought up that the Texans played in a different division. Like this is a really good division. So I don't, I don't know. I'm not expecting a Texans like rise just because this division is really good. And if they have that, then more power to them. But I just think it's hard to, I wasn't anticipating what Houston did last year. I wasn't anticipating Jacksonville kind of laying an egg down the stretch, but um, you know, and, but anyway, that's to me that good. But I think like it's funny because I talked to D'Amico Ryan's at the owners' meetings about that. Like, what? Why did you guys work? Like, what turned it around for you? And first of all, you get the right quarterback with the second pick. Second yeah. of all, as he said, like you're gonna. This is gonna sound Joe Gibbs like, but you win with people, right? And like they felt like they drafted some. They also had Will Anderson from the year before. They drafted Tank Dell. They had some really good picks that hit. You can get that. You can make a big improvement, whether or not they make the playoffs and when, you know, whatever they do, I don't know, but you can make, take a big step. Now the other one, Zach wants, so could you see him trading Allen for a tackle? No, no. I don't No. And here, can I, let me go first on that real quick. Part of it is that they're very big on building up the middle and you now have two really good tackles and you improved your linebacker situation. They feel like they've improved their safety situation. Don't, I don't see them weakening that, you know, and I don't know, I'd have to explore what teams would, who would be wanting to do that to trade a left tackle for a guy that, you know, could be in Allen's situation. I just, I would have a hard time seeing that, but I have a hard time seeing them make that t- trade as well. Newton could be really good, but I think there's nothing wrong with having three tackles who can pressure the passer. And that's what he does. He's different than Mathis too. Um, I'm going to tell you no on Allen. Um, and, and I'll tell you why, just from what I've heard, you know, being around the team lately, he's locked in yes. and they love him. And if you go ask Dan Quinn about, you know, uncertainty about him, he'll look at you sideways. Yeah. Um, he's not going anywhere. I, he's still part of the future. He's back locked in. And I've, I've only heard like he's re-energized about this whole thing and they want him here. So that that ain't happening. Like the whole John Allen is upset and all that stuff is a thing of the past with this group. Right. And, and, and I've been saying that for a while that it's, he's not sitting here upset about anything. I think for him during the season, who wasn't upset? Like it got to a point where you knew it wasn't going to work. So, and you know, if you're in his, at his stage, do you want to this long rebuild? Well, no, who, who would, but, like from the from the time Quinn got here, all I've heard is John's in a good spot. John's in a really good spot. They like him. They want him here. Yeah. And even though like he missed the first um, part of the OTA work, but it was because of a long scheduled vacation. He had been there already working out. The coaches were familiar with him. Like it was not you know like he would when they, when he made this trip, you weren't planning on having to be there in early April, and it was a trip that cost a ton. And he, you know, you don't, he didn't have, he had already been there. Right. And he's already back there. So it wasn't an issue for them. So um, anyway, he's in a good spot and they're in a good spot with him. What, role do, you, yeah. what role do you see the rookie D tackle Johnny Newton playing? I mean, to me, he's a guy who's going to be, uh, I could, you, I mean, I could see him being the third tackle Bram based on what we, what I've seen in him in college and what they, what they think of him. I could see him being a it could, you. They rotated those guys a lot last year, different group, and I think with Quinn, I could see him using him in some way a lot. And maybe you get to some more five D line sets where you can cause some pressure with three guys who can rush the passer, with him, Allen, and Payne. So what I liked with that pick is how Peters asked Quinn, "Hey, can you fi- get him on the field? Like, of course, right? Do you find a way because he's a good player." So I think they'll, I think they have a, I think they have a, this is what I say. And I think they have a plan for these guys. I think for him, it's to get them in there. You can rotate them, um, but he can rush the passer. You get those guys in the field, especially a guy like Dan Quinn, like that's what he wants. So I definitely see him being, having a, again, without seeing him on the field yet, what we know right now, I could see him having a a, a good role with this defense. Yeah. What about I, you, I, uh, for me, like, I think this is one of those where, um, I don't think they intended to draft him. I just think he was too good of a prospect on their board once he was there and they just couldn't pass him up. 
Um, if you go watch him at Illinois, he does move up and down the line a little bit. And there was one thing that happened at the end of last year that was noticeable about the line, but was effective was Deron Payne moved outside sometimes, not often, but did and actually, um, was effective from the edge at times kind of reinvigorated him. And he started having some, you know, people forget because the record was what it was. And, but he started to become much more effective that way. So I think this offers this unusual three defensive tackle alignment where you have specifically athletic defensive tackles like Newton and Payne, and it gives them options. I'm with you that I don't know what it's really going to look like, but I do think there are some interesting options with, with those three on the field together now. Absolutely. And, you know, so I got a couple more here. Dr. Wonderful, any chance they return to Leno or is he, has he retired? Um, no. <laughs> He ended up having hip surgery. I don't think he's going to be ready. And I don't, my own guess is that unless something changes, I think he's done. Um, and I think like, cause he even said on the podcast when I had him on that, you know, maybe during the season, if something happens and, you know, some the right situation arises, that's not a solution for these guys at this point. So no, that's a, and now we're going back to what it was that everybody said they wanted to get away from anyways. So yeah. they, everybody's talking about these injured guys. Like that's, that's not the answer. And that's why, you know, and as others have pointed out, it's not like Coleman hasn't played left tackle. He has the question isn't so much. Did he play in college? What can he do in the NFL? And there are definitely some people thought him as a tackle, some as a guard. So that's why I want to see him as a tackle, see what he can do. I think he can be a good player at one of those spots. They clearly think he's a tackle. So that's what we know. Uh, two more names before we go. Um, and SCA said, Deami Brown's been underwhelming. Could Luke McCaffrey challenge for his depth chart spot? Um, Different. Lauren Dotson, Crowder. Um, I think Zacchaeus right now. That would be four. Uh, McCaffrey, five, assuming all things go well. Deami Brown would be six. Six receivers, pretty typical. Till I hear otherwise, I, I don't know. Again, he's a name, you know, a carryover that we don't know how they feel about him, but let's see. You know, let's see. One thing is two things I know. One, Deami Brown is very fast and they want to get, they want to throw the ball deep. Now we've heard that before with him, right? I heard last year, like, oh, he's a great fit for that system. And then it's like, eh, you know, it didn't really happen, but he can get the ball deep. So I, you know, I'll be curious to see how they, what they envision for him. There are also different spots. So McCaffrey would be more of the slot. That's not Dammy Brown. So I think, you know, with that, but I think you're talking about roster spot versus positional spot. But yeah, I mean, you know, right now, if you look at the receiver group, I don't know who would beat him out. And I don't right. think that it's Luke McCaffrey versus him would be the way I would put it. Right. That's how I would say too. And I think, so I, you know, I'd be curious because Crowder is more of the slot. And I know he's returning, but they, that's one thing. Someone else wanted to know, talk about, People forget about Ricky Stromberg and Braden Daniels from last year's draft. No MV, they have not. That's the problem. That's why they're in this spot. Now, I will say, Ricky Stromberg, and you heard Leno say this if you listen to him on the podcast here, that there were guys in that room who felt like he should have been starting at center and um, last year before he got hurt. So I think, like, I'm curious to see how he develops, but they obviously signed Biotis for a reason, and um, – because they don't know. I don't know what they thought about Daniels last year. That group thought about him before the draft. But I do think I'm curious to see how he develops. Daniels had a long way to go. So if he develops, fine. But he looked like he had a long way to go. I would not count on him doing that. And so I'm not, I don't think people have forgotten about him. I ha I really haven't heard him mention him much at all. Doesn't mean he can't develop, but I we, you know, I would not count on that. And again, they 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 drafted Coleman because they knew they needed a left tackle. Now, could he develop into a backup? Maybe, you know, we'll see. I mean, again, give him a chance to improve, but he did not show anything last summer to suggest that in the next year, he would be the guy that could ascend to that role. That's just, that would be my take. So uh, the only other name that I want to bring up, because I just haven't brought it up is um, I'm also excited about Dom Hampton out of Washington. Yes. I like uh, him. He's got the traits, the look, the feel, violent, long arms, fast. Um, and, you know, Washington got a tremendous amount of uh, hype for Penix and Adunze and all the offensive players, you know, rightfully so for as far as they got. Um, defensively, he was a standout for them. Um, and you don't get 
you know, like go ask Caleb Williams about this. You don't get this far with one side of the ball being good and the other side being a wreck. And Washington wasn't that way on that side of the ball. Um, that was a spot where some depth was needed again. Remember, Cam Curl's not here. So, you know, I like Quan Martin. I'm going to be very interested to see how they utilize him. I want to see what they think about him on the field. I think they're going to like Derek Forrest a lot as a carryover. He plays with that speed and violence yeah. that they like. But this guy might be um, someone who plays a strong-ish backup role. The only other safety out there, right, that I can think of is Jeremy Reeves, who's really a special teamer. So I liked this pick as well. It kind of fit in the kind of modus operandi of the type of players that they're looking for. He's got the traits. I'm not going crazy here. He's a fifth-round pick. He's a fifth-round pick for a reason. But I did like that one as well. Right. And by the way, someone else for the receivers brought up Mitch, uh, Tinsley, like, I don't put him ahead of those guys, but again, we'll see how they develop. And and it's a new group. I just think there's a lot of unknowns how they view, but they have the same receivers coach. So that is one thing, but um, I'll see how they develop. But, you know, he doesn't have the speed. If you want to get the ball deep, you want guys with speed. So this is another one, Bram, too. Zach wants to know, with all the linebackers signed and drafted, how will Jamin fit in? Most, most likely walking in free agency after this year, question mark. And someone else said, Jamin will have a Pro Bowl type year with this coaching staff. So there's some opinions. So I will say this. There are definitely people over there who feel like this staff will help him out a lot and um, that it could make a big difference. But you also signed two guys in free agency. And you also signed, like you brought up Dom Hampton. Hampton's gonna, Hampton can play that big nickel role for them. Like the cover, if he can show that he can cover tight ends, he could go and play early on. I like his physical play up near the line. Um, so that could cut into some of their packages. I don't know for Jamin Bram, how they're going to use him per se, because you can't like, they like Wagner a lot. They love Frankie Louvu and they should, but Jamin's got some talent too. And I'll be curious to see how the impact of this coaching staff on him. So I'm withholding judgment. I'm not shocked. I wasn't surprised at all that they didn't pick up a fifth year option. There was no reason to. Because they, you just don't know. And you, why would you invest that kind of money in a guy that you're not really sure about yet? But I do think there could be an impact. But I also wonder, Bram, how much action he'll get, how they'll work all these guys in there. What do you think? Yeah, I, his role is undetermined to me. Right. Uh, I'm like you also not surprised they didn't pick up the fifth-year option. And they're not going to commit themselves to that. doesn't mean they can't resign him at a later date. I... You know, I've thought, you know, in watching him through the years so far that he's better going straight line forward than he is yeah. trying to get out in coverage. Mm -hmm. So maybe they'll find a way to utilize his speed and athleticism that way because he can be a devastating playmaker with his speed. Um, will they use him on the edge a little bit as a stand up rush end? I don't know. You know, like I I'd, I'd have to ask them, but I could see that conceivably being a role. Maybe. I don't know. Um, is he going to be someone who's more apt to blitz? you know, then maybe yes. get caught in coverage. Yeah, that's what I think. But his an un, he's an undetermined role, and, and I'll be interested to see. I do know this, and this is why I don't want to ever give up on him. I just, he's such a tremendous high-level athlete that if someone can get, you know, flip the light bulb on for him and find the spot where he can be successful, then he's an asset. So that's yeah. why I'm, I'm hoping that they can figure that out. All right, hold yeah. on. Before we go, you have to answer the question. Which well, I let me say one more. Let me say one more thing on Jamin because that is one thing they wanted to know. Like, can he be an effective blitzer? Because I think that's a role they would see him in. He's not. He's not necessarily a rush end because I don't see him lining up like that. But you know, I don't. I don't know that they see. Don't don't see him that way. But I would have a hard time with that. But I think as a blitzer, that's what they're going to need to find out. Can he do that effectively? Because that's going to be a big part of this defense. And that's where Sandra still, as a slot corner can be a big help too, because he is a good blitzer as well. So I think it gives you some versatility and more options. Go ahead. All right. Last thing. What oh. number is Jaden Daniels getting, John? Like no one seems to have reported this yet. What number yeah. is <clears throat> Well, I would be surprised if he's anything but number five. So I think one thing I will say is I do think he knows and has been told what a respected player Tress Way is and what a good guy he is. So my guess is Tress is a Tress understands things very well and would know like the importance of this kid to the future of this franchise. And um, I could see, I, I don't know anything just yet. There's other things to worry that I have to worry about before we get to the numbers, but knowing Tress and knowing how Daniels would approach it, 
I could see something being worked out where he would get number five. Um, so that that's what I would say. But, you know, I don't know. I don't know. That's just my guess. That's not anything other than I know that he I know that he's been versed on Tress and, and what a good guy he is and what a what a what an important player he is here because he's been a good player for a long time with for this franchise. So you've got to approach it respectfully. And I think he will. I think one of the things, Bram, too, from the press conference last week with Daniels, he certainly seems to understand the history and 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 this organization's place in the game, et cetera, and what it means to the city. I mean, he's a football junkie. I think that's one of the things that I in talking to a lot of people about him, he's a football junkie. So I think he'd whatever happens with it, it would be approached with a lot of respect for, for Tressway. Good. Join the club. I'm a football junkie too. <laughs> Can you play quarterback? No. You play left tackle. You do. I can't I've play seen left Bre- tackle. Either. I've you seen don't... your. I've seen your kick step. It ain't pretty. I'm. Uh, I'm pr- I think I'm satisfied with my role. My role is where I should be. Yeah, me too. I'm okay over here. It's. 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 Listen. The one thing I've always said about being a sports reporter, Bram, is like I can sit here and tell you, be very definitive on what's going to happen in a game or something like that. And then when the opposite happens, I can be definitive about why it happened. It's a great, you can, you know, sometimes you can never be wrong, I guess, right? <laughs> even though, even though we often are. So anyways, um, Bram, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Appreciate everybody tuning in and I'll be back with another episode. What is it? What's today? Tuesday, hopefully Thursday. I think Thursday morning, I'll be back with one and I'll have a bunch next, a few next week. So talk to you guys next time. Thanks for tuning in.